Peace of the Lord be with you and also with you. Good morning. I've got to say it's been a, it's been one of the mornings, hasn't it, Doug? Good morning if you're online. You've, you've only, you've, we've only just made it, to be quite honest, but we're here. Uh, we've had to change things around slightly. But that is all irrelevant because we're here, as I said, to worship and to glorify God. We continue this morning with the Lord's Prayer. Um, we had a we actually we uh, Charles has been doing a, a Bible study, which has been great. It's given us some good insight into it. Um, I'll probably recommend that again to you during notices. But just for now, it's great to see you all this morning. Let's just come to our worship and let's say together: Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And we're just going to come to a time of confession. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is the only Lord. You shall love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. So, brothers and sisters, let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firm resolve to keep God's commandment, and to live in love and peace with all. And we say together, Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbour as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you 
our God. Amen. So just for a moment, I just want you to think of anything that's heavy on your heart this week, anything that you've said that you possibly think you shouldn't have said, any action that you shouldn't have done. Just take a moment and just bring that to God. So, Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as a forgiven people, we're going to say our affirmation of faith together. We say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we're going to come to a time of intercession. I've got a video this morning to watch and some music to go with it, and I'm just going to prompt as a with a few words and a little bit of pause for your own thoughts this morning. So let's come to prayer. In our intercession this morning, let's engage with the prayer Jesus taught us. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever and ever. Amen. So let's just for a short time, let's revisit and reflect prayerfully on the different sections of this prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We acknowledge, Father God, that you are different, that you are holy. We confess that we are only human despite sometimes in imagining ourselves to be gods. You alone are God. You alone are holy. And we start this prayer time by worshipping your all. Give us today our daily bread. Let's mention our own needs before our good Father, who loves to provide for his children. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Just for a moment, let's allow God to search us and reveal where we have thought, spoke and acted in ways that contradict God's loving character. Where we have sought our own glory instead of 
service where we have not loved our neighbour as ourselves. Confess these things to our gracious Father who is sure to grant forgiveness to his Son, Jesus Christ. treat each other and God's creation, in arrowing news stories, in the suffering of friends and family. Let's just for a moment cry out to God to acknowledge our sorrow in the face of these things and ask that God delivers us from evil. again for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever Amen and Let's say the prayer our Saviour taught us Our Father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven give us today our daily bread forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for the kingdom the power and the glory are yours now and forever amen and as we come to our collect for this morning Faithful Lord, whose steadfast love never ceases and whose mercies never come to an end, grant us the grace to trust you and to receive the gifts of your love new every morning in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And this morning's reading is taken from Psalm 105, 1 to 4. This is probably one of the shortest readings I've ever done at church. What did you say? Hallelujah. <laughs> Give grace to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, and tell of his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength, seek his face always. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's been wonderful doing, um, overlooking Lord's Prayer. I think Lord's Prayer is something that we all take for granted. And, um, oh, sorry, Doug, I will try and stay still. I'm not right, good at staying still. I'm not as bad as David, though, am I? Oh. Um, yeah, it's been wonderful sort of revisiting Lord's Prayer and look at it. So it's, a, it's a prayer that we, we, we say all the time. It's a, probably a prayer that we can say actually without even thinking 
about what we're saying and I think many times actually that's what we do I, I certainly do there's been times when if I'm stuck for prayer I just say Lord's Prayer I, I always think it's a bit of a get out clause I do it because it's it's simple it's easy to use but actually the, it, there's such depth and there's such meaning to Lord's Prayer I think it's wonderful that we are visiting again so this morning I'm going to look at the the line just hallowed be thy name I'm sure they sort of drew straws. I'm sure I got short straw. I mean, what on earth can you talk about? Hallowed be thy name. And that's all I get. Thanks, David. What does this word hallowed mean? Well, in English dictionary, hallowed is used to describe something that is respected and admired, usually because of its old importance or of good reputation. And it gives an example. I love this example. Every cricketer wants to prove his worth on the hallowed turf of lords. It's what? And then I'm pleased to say that the dictionary actually saves itself. It goes on to say, hallowed is used to describe something that is considered to be holy. And it's a strange word, isn't it, hallowed? It's a strange word. And if, if I believe if I'm stood on hallowed ground, I can always sense God's presence. Have you ever been in a situation where you've, You've just, said that you've just sensed there's something different about this place. There's something reverent, something holy. You know, and at times like that, I've, I've, it's, it's happened many times. It's actually happened here at St. Catherine's many a time. And do you know what? I want to kick my shoes off because I'm stood on all our ground. I want to kneel and I want to bow down in front of God. If Queen came today, we'd probably all bow, wouldn't we? Why shouldn't we bow in front of our God? But out of a church context, the only other time we think of this word adored is either at Halloween or if you're like me and you like to watch Harry Potter. We get Harry Potter and the, Death, uh, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows. And I can't actually see any, either of these two being holy. Let me just ask you a question for a moment. Have you ever sensed that God has been present in your life? Well, I have on numerous occasions. I've sensed God here at St. Catherine's. And I always find when God's present, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. And unfortunately, I'm usually leading worship. And if I kicked off my shoes and I knelt down, you'd probably all think, what on earth is he doing? So I sort of refrain from doing this. But one of these days, I'm going to do it. I'm going to stand here. I'm going to kick my shoes off. And I'm going to kneel down. And you're all going to think, what's he doing? Just remember, we're in the presence of God. The first time I ever really sensed the presence of God were in 1985. I was 21. I know I don't look that old. But I was. I was a regular church goer. I've been confirmed at the age of 16. I was an acolyte. I've told you this before. I wear a nice red dress, white frilly collar. I used to wink at all choir girls. Sorry, Sally. And if I were lucky, they'd wink back at me. Some of them did. But that year, 1985, me and Sally, we had a long weekend in Paris. I love Paris. It was the first time we'd ever been to Paris. And it was a time when you did things cheap. It cost us £99 each for a long weekend. Oh, what's £99 each? I think last time we went, it cost us nearly 800 quid, didn't it? For a weekend. This were pretty good kids, of course. Happy days. Good morning. Pre-kids, happy days, £99 weekend in Paris. Hallelujah. What more is that? But this particular weekend that we went in 1985, it was Remembrance Weekend. And on Sunday, we decided to go to Notre Dame. I'd never been, well, first time in Paris. Of course, you've not been to Notre Dame before, Andrew. But what an incredible experience, Notre Dame. And, and as we went in, it, what, it, it were, the atmosphere was just electric. It was absolutely Electric. It was an atmosphere that I've never sensed. It was so moving. And I remember sort of welling up with tears. I actually remember kneeling down. I can be an emotional person when I want to be. She calls me a big softy. But Notre Dame filled me with tears because I could experience and sense the presence of God. It was, it was just such a righteous, holy moment. It was incredible. And there were another memorable time that I can encounter 
the Holy Spirit. But this one in a big cathedral, not a fancy building. This was in Shepton Mallet at the showground in a huge tent with seven to 8,000 people all worshipping God. A guy called Martin Smith from a guy, uh, group pro, from, uh, called Delirious were playing on stage. You, you'll know his songs. If I were to paint a Martin Smith song, you'd, you'd know it. And that night, was, it was really lively. Everybody's jumping up and down, seven, 8,000 people dancing in an arena, singing away, jumping up and down. And then all of a sudden, everything started to grind to a halt. The music slowed down until it eventually stopped. Everyone stopped dancing. Everybody stopped jumping up and down. We all stopped singing. Some of us bowed our heads. Some of us kicked off our shoes and knelt on the floor. And when I looked up, the Holy Spirit of God was present. It was like a red cloud moving like a wave. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It was just... Just incredible. It wells me up now just thinking about it. An encounter that I've never ever had like before. And an encounter that I've actually never had since. Strong, powerful. Not just for me, but for many people in that arena to, that night. It must have been a life changing experience. And when I tell people out of church or my family, they think I'm crazy. What are you on about? A red cloud going over everybody. He's lost it. Holy ground. Eventually everything started kicking back in again. Music started going. We started singing. We started jumping up and down. And what an evening we had. It was just one of them evenings you never ever wanted it to stop. It was amazing. Holy ground. Being in the presence of God. Holy is his name. You see, holy ground is not just four walls with pews and for a group of Christians. It's not just a place where we contemplate and pray. It can be the loudest, liveliest event around us. You may be on a beach walking. You may be in the garden. But when God turns up, you're on holy ground. And if you soak up that presence of God, you tend not to see the surroundings around you. You don't see four walls. And if it does happen, don't worry about the right words. Because you've got to worry more about getting the right heart it's not what we say it's how we sense it's our approach to God you've got to have your heart and your mind right God doesn't seek eloquence God seeks honesty he seeks reverence he seeks respect and he may turn up in your life at the most unexpected moments and you might never ever know why God turned up at that moment you know, when the disciples asked Jesus to teach him how to pray, Jesus responded with what, the, what we call the Lord's Prayer. It used to be called sometimes the Disciples' Prayer. Jesus models his prayers on our Father in heaven. Kathy unpacked it all a little bit for us last week. But this second bit is a petition, or if you want a request, usually someone in, to someone in authority, in our case, our Father, our God, and we say, hallowed be your name. Allo in the original Greek is agizio and it means to make or to render or to declare something as sacred or holy or to mentally venerate or revere. So when Jesus instructed his disciples to say, Allo be thy name, he was declaring that God's name is holy and showing reverence to that name. In Jewish culture, names were not simply a way to call a person, but rather names were there to reflect a person's character to show them the essence of identity and to declare that person's destiny. We were doing Genesis not long ago and um, the cultural practice is for Jacob, when God changed Jacob's name, there were, if you remember we spoke about Jacob wrestling through the night with this, with this figure, uh, God. The name Jacob meant eel catcher or trickster, taking us back to his birth story and God changed Jacob's name to Israel meaning one who strives with God. Another example is in John 1, Jesus changed Simon's name from Simon to Peter, meaning the rock. I want to be a rock. And Moses, when Jesus meets God in the burning bush, he asks, what name am I? I supposed to call you by, what am I supposed to call you by? And God says, I am who I am. And that's God's name. 
In the King James' Bible, it translates as Yahweh. It's a verb, it's a being, it's a life. And the name is so holy. There's another one I can think of actually, and it's Andrew. And it means manly and strongly. I like that. 2,000 years ago, people wouldn't say God's name. In the Hebrew Bible, the name of God, when it's written down, is indicated by the consonants. But the vowels are written differently so that you're not reading it out loud. It's like a cue not to speak the name of God. Instead, they would have called God Adonai, which means my Lord. Because the name is so holy, we wouldn't say, we wouldn't want to say, they avoided using it in a way that didn't reflect God's honour and way it deserves. And even today, you know, Jews, in Jewish culture, instead of writing God, G-O-D, they write G, uh, G dash D, God. It's still reverence is God's name that the word say God, the name of God. And Jesus is not only declaring that God's name is holy, he's also asking that God actively allow his own name, making it set apart and be venerated. In this request, Jesus is asking that God visibly demonstrates his glory in order to increase his renown. In other words, he offers a condition of being known or talked about by many people. It echoes to Psalm 113. This is a psalm that you'll have heard of. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. Jesus begins his prayer by recognising that God is a loving father who invites us into his presence, but then Jesus quickly draws attention to God's holiness, asking that God increases his renown. He shifts the focus of prayer from us and he places it squarely on God. Hallowed be your name, holy is your name. All of a sudden we're focused on God. And he's asking the world to believe in the extent of his glory. How many people on this earth must say this prayer? Hallowed be your name. Asking God to be hallowed is a name, it's another way of asking God to draw people to himself by demonstrating his glory and his power in this world. And the context for the rest of this prayer, I don't know if you can see that. The very next phrase, a full prayer given in Matthew's account, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I put it in red, and at the bottom, and the glory are yours now and forever. We start with the glory in God. We finish with glory in God. And do you know, so actually, something I've just noticed this. Sorry, I'm going off path. Something I've just noticed is everything in that prayer, when we get into the next kingdom, we can do away with. Because we'll already be in heaven. We'll already have our daily bread. Our sins will already be forgiven. We're in the kingdom of heaven. Lead us not into temptation. There won't be any temptation. There won't be any evil. Hallowed be your name. We'll always say that. We'll always have to glorify God's name. Hallowed be your name. I've just noticed that now. So the next time you recite, Hallowed be your name, know that you are declaring that God is holy and worthy of praise. And you're asking him to increase his glory here on earth with more people who will recognise his immeasurable worth. We, when we read Lord's Prayer, when we're reading God's name, was, is, and always will be. It will always be holy. We read that name. It's deserving of all reverence and honour that we can give. And the amazing next step is that through Jesus, we too can also become holy. We can be made holy in him. Not because of what we do, but because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And if we look at today's, David picked this psalm today. At first I wondered why. But when you actually start to break it down. David picks this psalm to go with today's sock. It's a really lovely piece of writing. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell all of his wonder, wonderful acts. Glory is his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. We've heard that a lot just recently. Let me seek his face always. David picked this psalm to go with this talk. It's, it's a 
wonderful piece of writing. And the psalmist King David, in this case, who wrote it, he tells us to sing praises to the glory of God's name. A God that's been with us since the beginning of time. A God who has planned and witnessed it all of scripture. The same God that is with us this morning. God is the one whom glory comes first. God's glory is the source, the wellspring from which all glories ring. As human beings, we have a tendency to trust in earthly things. In earthly relationships, their own powers, talents or beauty or the goodness we see in others. But you know, when these things fade and they inevitably do, we start to despair. And we all need to realise is that God's glory is constant. As we journey through life, we see God's glory manifest everywhere. In this person, in that forest, walking on a beach, in a cathedral in Notre Dame, in a tent in Somerset with 8,000 people. Maybe it might be here at St. Catherine's. It might be even in your own personal lives. Everything goes back to God in the end. And the only way to to God is through Jesus Christ. And we will find the very source of all beauty in Jesus Christ. Nothing will be lost to us. All things will fade when we get to that kingdom of heaven. And we'll find him again. The Lord's Prayer, if we take it seriously, allows us to continue to stay in touch with God. But somehow we have to allow his name. And we ought to worship and live in such a way that God's name is our Lord. Help us to truly know, to honour, to glorify and to praise you, our God. We're not asking anything of ourselves, we're asking something of God. We're asking, in effect, God to be God here and everywhere. Let your blazing glory shine in the world. Let your awesome power and love be felt and experienced by everyone. Let everything in the universe vibrate with the beauty of holiness. Oh, Father God, let the whole world know who you really are. It seems a bit strange, doesn't it, that the disciples ask Jesus to teach them how to pray. And we usually think of Jesus' disciples as um, spiritually mature people, more attuned to such religious things as prayer. Why else would Jesus have chosen them people? But apparently they were normal people, just like we are. Sometimes struggle, sometimes we don't know how to pray. Perhaps one of the hardest things about prayer is learning how to pray according to God's will and not our own. For instance, if we can approach prayer, prayer as a gimme machine, pray for this, pray for that, expect God to grant all of our requests at once, whether they allow to his purpose or not, that's not right. But this is how Jesus wanted his disciples to pray. As we look deeper and hear this instruction to pray, Father, Allah be, Allah be your name, we begin to understand that the starting, prayer, uh, the starting point of all prayer is holiness to God. Whatever comes after that, our needs, our wants, our desires must always be first seen through the holiness of God. To start our prayer from another place will set the focus on us rather than God. So this prayer attunes us into God. Questions then are this, what will bring about the holiness of God in our world? How will our prayers bring about his purposes and will for his people and his creation? And how do we align our requests with what God wants in our lives and those around us? Hallowed be your name. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for the way you far exceed the limits of our minds. Your mercy takes our breath away and your love knows no bounds. We praise you for your glory which is utterly beyond our imagining and for your goodness which sustains the whole universe. Your power stretches from one end of an eternity to the other before the world was even made, before there was anything to be seen, before a sound was heard or a chord excited the senses, you were God. 
And we pray that your love has reached out to our own hearts and lives. And through your Holy Spirit is changing us and making us into the people you always meant us to be. So Holy God, hallowed be your name. We praise you in Christ and we give you all the glory. Amen. Father, we just thank you for being here this morning, for standing among us. God, as we come before you now at your table, I just pray that you fill us with your reverence, reverence, with your love. Just fill our hearts, fill our minds. Allow us to be one body, to allow us to be one church, one Eucharist. Continue to be with us, Lord. Throughout this life, the times of troubles, the times of despair, but also the times of joy, times of love, times of peace. So come, Lord Jesus, come and be with us now as we come and prepare this table with you. Amen. Amen. So the Lord be with you and also with you. Jesus prepared, sorry, Jesus prayed to the Father for his disciples, saying, May they be one as you and I are one, that the world may know that I sent you. And we say together, Almighty God, through the sacrifice of your Son Jesus Christ, you have revealed for us sanctify us in your truth and set us free to serve you in humble prayers on the night before he died he had supper with his friends and taking his bread he praised you he broke the bread and gave it to them and said take eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me When the supper was ended, he took the cup of wine and again he praised you. He gave it to them and said, drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many and the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Everybody's welcome to the Lord's table. Please just wait until either Pete or Sally just directs you, and we know the process, don't we, to, to go around, shall we?
Father, we just thank you for this time, for this wonderful time and this opportunity where we can come together as your people. Even those that are at home this morning, we offer the bread to them, Lord. Even not physically, we do it spiritually. And we just pray a blessing on everybody that's watching this service this morning, whether physically or at home. And we just thank you for our time together, Lord Jesus. We just thank you that you stand amongst us this morning. For in all this time of trouble and strife, you never let us go. Father, you are holy. You are God. And nothing, nothing will defeat you. We just thank you for our time together. Holy and blessed God, you have fed us with the body and blood of your Son, and filled us with your Holy Spirit. May we honour you, not only with our lips, but in lives dedicated to the service of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we say together, Merciful God, you have called us to your table and fed us with the bread of life. Draw us and all your people to serve your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Can we stay here, Doug? <laughs> I'll come back over there because I've got the blessing, haven't I?
I've, I've not really got any notes, just to, to be honest, I have to say that. All I can do is just sort of mention again about Charles' um, Bible study. Um, it's, it's really good, there were more of us this week. If you do want to be a part of that, um, just either contact um, Charles um, or David or, Ka uh, not sorry, not David, David's on all of this week, please don't contact David. Um, Kathy or myself and we can get a link to you to, um, to that study if you wish to come and join us. Um, just to say, and all, we did have an uh, annual general meeting on Thursday night, which went really well, as well as things could be. Um, that were on Zoom. It was, what did David say? The most strangest APCM in the most strangest year. And I think, yeah, it is. And just to say, we'll be back in February. This is the last time you're going to see us till February, I'm afraid. If I'm saying afraid, you might be glad. Oh, God, get out of here. <laughs> So, but um, you will still all be in our prayers. So let's just finish with this morning's blessing. Father, whose glory fills the heavens and cleans you, and cleans you by his holiness and send you to proclaim his word. And the blessing of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love today and always. Amen. So may the Father take hold of our lives, fill us with your spirit and send us out into your world as examples of your grace and witnesses to your... Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. So